we welcome Richard Gingras, Vice President of News for Google. Last March, Mr. Gingras announced the Google News Initiative, a 300 million project based on journalism, sustainability, and newsroom cost efficiency. He is co-founder of Salon.com and has worked for Apple, the At Home Network, and the Excite Portal. Please welcome Richard Gingras. Thank you very much. It's delightful to be here in Pittsburgh and, 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 and certainly quite stimulating and enjoyable to be with many of the minds in, in this room. Um, what she did not mention is that uh, I've been working in the digital space since 1979, as I often say, since the days of steam-powered modems, <laughs> which were way cooler than the sail-powered modems, I should, I, I should make clear. In 1791, when the First Amendment came to be, one could not have imagined what it would entail two centuries later. Back then, printing presses and the physical movement of paper were the most advanced way to share ideas beyond the scope of an oral conversation. It could take weeks or months for a debate to reach a national scope. Keep that point in mind. Since then, our voices have carried faster and further than ever before first by the telegraph, then by radio and television. Along with those developments, the meaning of free expression expanded. The words and voices of those few who had access to these media carried more weight than ever before. While free expression became a universal right, the fault lines of its enforcement seemed to focus mostly on the freedom of the press and that of artists, activists, researchers, advocates, because that's who had most opportunity to speak, to share controversial views, to push the envelope of our comfort zones. Up to the 1990s, receiving information became increasingly easy, and certainly the case now, but publishing information continued to be the privilege of the few. For everyone else, expression was constrained to a circle of friends and coworkers. The public square was top down, not bottoms up. The internet changed that. It put a printing press in everyone's hands. Everyone had the opportunity to share their voice in the public square, and they did. The World Wide Web now has more than 1.7 billion websites. Billion with a B. In the United States, we can easily see the internet as the First Amendment come to life. It changed how we communicate, how we learn, how we shop, how we sell, how we are informed of the issues of the day, how we form opinions about the issues of the day, how we develop perceptions of the world around us and of each other. The internet in exponentially expanded both the marketplace for ideas and the marketplace for information. It has brought extraordinary value to our societies and introduced disruptive challenges to our institutions, to our politics, and yes, to the press itself. Essentially, existentially, it poses the paradoxical question in my mind, how can democracies survive and thrive in an environment of unfettered free expression? Big challenges, that's why we're here today. But it has also yielded great benefit, and let's not forget that. It has never been easy for small or less heard voices to speak. Maybe they're on the other side of the world, maybe they're right next door. It has never been easier for political and civic organizations to communicate, coordinate, and mobilize, often benefiting voices that were perhaps left aside by existing political organizations. It has never been easier for people to find health information, for farmers to find market information, for young and old to learn new skills. And it certainly has never been easier to create, whether in the arts or culture or in the fields of business, engineering, or science. New ideas, new storytelling, new products are literally being kickstarted into existence without the vetting by, by gatekeepers. Our youngest generations take this world for granted fully understanding they need no one else's blessing to attempt to shape the cultures and societies in which they live. If that disrupts our thinking, so be it. But yes, it also brings challenges to our existing behaviors, to our modes of thinking, 
to the models of our industries. The newspaper industry is a particularly relevant example of the disruption of markets and business models. For print media, this has wrought the most profound disruption. Just 30 years ago, the daily newspaper was the internet of its community, though not in an open, interactive sense. It was where you found nearly all the information you needed to live in your community, from job listings to movie times to sports reports. But the internet, that printing press, spawned a vastly competitive marketplace of information and services. User behaviors changed dramatically. Think about it. Who here, like my dad, would now go to a newspaper in search of a used car for his kid? Who here, like my mom, would go to a newspaper for a recipe for Sunday dinner and then put it in a three-ring binder? Or movie reviews or fashion advice? Today, these same services are available often for free from a multiplicity of sources, from Monster.com to Craigslist. Why do I mention this? I mention it because classified ad revenue, for instance, was 40% of a newspaper's revenue. It disappeared with the advent of online marketplace. It's not even considered advertising anymore. For newspapers, that's a challenge because it was the classifieds, the department stores, the supermarkets, the auto dealers that made those businesses the massively successful near monopolistic forces in their communities that they were in the modern age of newspapering. Serious news by itself never generated the revenue. So let's fast forward to today. Some news organizations, due to their size, brand recognition, and creativity, are succeeding in transitioning to the digital economy. They've shifted to subscription models, which used to be 3% of their revenue, is now becoming a majority. Like the New York Times, which now boasts 4 million subscribers, more than they ever had in the days of print. But for many businesses, the business of news is in a process of transformation. The very practice of journalism is being reinvented. But through the dust of disruption, we are seeing strong seedlings of the future of news, most importantly at the local level, where entrants like the Texas Tribune in Austin, Berkeley Side in Berkeley, California, Village Media in a dozen cities in Eastern Canada are finding paths to success. But it's a new model, it's a different model, with a beneficial shift toward community engagement being a key theme. But also, in a world with unfettered free expression, the nature of both public discourse and political engagement changes. Yes, the internet can elevate noble speech, that which appeals to our better angels and allows us to find consensus. But the internet also enables heinous speech, where anger, outrage, or self-righteousness can be turned into a hatred of others. Sadly, as we well know, it is far easier to stimulate an audience with intensely emotional content than it is with more nuanced, complex analysis. Since emotions tend not to prioritize accuracy, we're more easily fall prey to misinformation. I want to be very clear. These are not new trends in human behavior. These are not new trends in the use of information for political purposes. They didn't begin with the internet. They're not representative of any particular ideology. But note, there is a core principle at play here regarding the mathematics of media distribution. As a society's access to media from a publishing perspective becomes more open, the media space becomes intrinsically, mathematically more divisive. Think about it. If you want to unify a society, all other principles aside, then the one voice media model of Kim Jong-un will do the trick. In the US, in the 1960s and 70s, with only four TV networks, it could enable the theoretically unifying voice of Uncle Walter Cronkite. In the 1990s, cable television and cable news networks split that unifying dialogue quite forcefully, as they continue to do today. Then the internet happened, breaking the information space into a million shards, into a million channels. 
While none of these behaviors are new, the vast scale and capability of the internet challenge us like never before. It challenges our core understanding that supporting free expression means accepting that each and every one of us will encounter expression that we in our own way find uncomfortable, if not heinous. These challenges must be addressed by every institution if we're both to protect free expression itself and a functioning democratic republic that we value. So how do our institutions respond? How might participants, even like online service providers such as Google, respond? I want to take you some of our challenges as we grapple with this. I'm often asked, Richard, why does Google search let all this bad content online? Surely you could do a better job of taking down this or that piece of grossly inappropriate content. To be sure, as we do our work, we're always looking to improve what we do. But I will note the internet expands with millions of documents every hour. 15% of the search queries we see each day are queries we've never seen before. But when it is demanded that we take down or block certain content, let's be clear, we don't take down things from the internet. We cannot do so. So the conversation and the implications of that are far more compl are complicated. It is indeed our role to help you find the information you need, but even what does that imply? As a former publisher, my preferred definition of journalism is to give citizens the tools and information they need to be good citizens. At Google, our role with search and news is to give citizens the tools and information they need to develop their own critical thinking and reach their own, hopefully, more informed conclusions, and to do so in an assiduously apolitical way. Each and every word there is important. When you do a Google search, we show you results that are relevant to your query from sources as authoritative as we can determine about that given topic. When we say authoritative, many people imagine we handpick websites and arbitrarily determine which are better than others. Nothing could be further from the truth. Authoritativeness is gauged algorithmically based on many signals for specific pages and specific to each type of query. For instance, and appropriately, our algorithms might find ESPN to be highly authoritative about college football, but not so much about gardening. Most importantly, our algorithms are trained by the feedback of more than 10,000 raters in each country around the world who follow a rigorous method outlined in a 160-page public document which you can scrutinize. We take their evaluations of our results, their assessments of the nature of the information we're seeing, and plug that back into our models. And we constantly make changes in that army of raiders. Again, we don't pick the winners. Not appropriate for us to do so. As I noted, our work is assiduously apolitical. Our algorithms do not have classifiers trying to define the political leanings of a page or a website, or a user. In spite of criticism you might hear, that is simply not the case. While Google search will tune your results to surface restaurants and businesses near you, we do not personalize Google search results or adjust them to your beliefs. Again, we do not attempt to define the political ideology of our users. We seek to provide a diverse array of information so that you can reach your own conclusions. Similarly, we have strict policies and processes to ensure that product decisions are based on quantifiable measures of improved user benefit and never based on the political opinions of any individual on our teams. We don't even have those conversations. I certainly wouldn't put up with them, not for a second. As I always note, algorithms are not perfect, nor will they ever be. The ecosystem, as I mentioned earlier, is constantly changing. Sometimes we get it wrong, and that leads to new learnings. And here's an example. 
The day of the Las Vegas shooting, we had more than 20 million queries for that phrase. Our results actually performed well. We were watching them carefully. But also that day, the website 4chan nefariously targeted an alleged suspect by the name of Gary Danley. They attacked him. They doxed him. When people searched for Gary Danley's name, and 3,000 people did that day versus the 20 plus million who searched for Vegas shooting, the 4chan result did appear. We were criticized for that. Here's what we did right, and here's what we did wrong and help you understand the complexity of the role in which we play. It was absolutely correct to present the 4chan result against that narrow query of the person's name. Important to that individual, I want to know if I'm being doxxed. Important to journalists covering the story. Important to our society to know that was happening. However, the mistake that we did make was presenting the 4chan link in a user interface module at the top of the page labeled Top Stories, rather than in the standard blue links. Top Stories conveys a level of authority and endorsement that the 4chan result clearly did not deserve. It didn't belong there. We fixed that problem. We enhanced our tuning of authoritativeness ranking, particularly during breaking news events, which not surprisingly are magnets to bad actors. There are many queries where we surface low quality results. These are not mistakes. They are foundational to the role of search and the value it provides. Again, we drive towards authority, but we will let you find what there is to be found. With Google search, that is a fundamental tension. As I said, our objective is to present users with authoritative information. Billions of users trust us to do that every day. But a search engine should allow you to find anything that is findable in the corpus of legal expression in the domain in which you live, including the dark corners of the web. No one should want Google to decide what is acceptable or unacceptable expression. For instance, if you ask about cancer cures, you'll prominently find lists of commonplace cancer treatments. However, for a while, if you search for peach pits cure cancer, you'd find just that, websites claiming that peach pits do in fact cure cancer. Not surprisingly, there wasn't an article from the New England Journal of Medicine saying, oh, it doesn't. So we took some action over the last several years. Now, if you search for peach pits cure cancer today, you might find something more helpful. My team spent years enabling an open ecosystem of new sites and organizations creating fact checks to help debunk spurious claims that can surface in search results. That's great. It's an example of how we try to do our jobs to enable an organic ecosystem of good information to counter the bad information. That's one of many efforts that we've initiated to pave the way for a sustainable, high-quality news ecosystem, particularly given the disruption. In March, as noted, we launched the Google News Initiative to stimulate innovation in journalism and to ensure a wide range of authoritative journalistic content continues to be available. By the way, some might ask, why do we do this, besides the fact that it's a good idea? It's important to note that Google search, the value of Google search is dependent on there being a rich ecosystem of knowledge that others create. So it's on our interest to see that happen. And our ad platforms, which is where we make our money, are used by two million publishers around the world and we only succeed when they do. So we have an intrinsic interest in working with publishers around the world for them to find success in creating quality content. The Google News Initiative represents our largest global effort. We've committed $300 million over the next three years to stimulate industry efforts. We seek to elevate and strengthen quality journalism by enabling new structural approaches to journalism, like data journalism, like global fact check community that I mentioned, as well as new frameworks to understand the provenance of online expression, where is it coming from, which we're doing through the Trust Project. 
I don't go so far, by the way. I heard this mentioned yesterday to suggest that anonymity should be, should be not allowed. I don't think that makes any sense in a free and open society. I do think, however, it will be importantly, increasingly clear for those who want to be believed, for those who want to be seen as credible, to practice dramatic transparency in letting everyone know who they are and why they think they know what they know. We seek to enable new business models with efforts like subscribe with Google and tools to enable publishers to better understand their markets and grow their audiences. We seek to empower news organizations through technical innovation by building tools that either cut costs or expand capabilities. Yes, there's always more we can do and I'm sure many of you have ideas, but we're not alone in this. We all need to step up. I spent the last 18 months as a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, considering how to address these challenges, recognizing there are no silver bullets, realizing the only path lies in the determined and principled behavior of our leaders in all dimensions of society. There is no defined institutional structure, no framework of communications policy and technology, no policy structure that will solve this without wise leadership that can inspire others. We, as citizens, are enabled by constitutional principles, but we only thrive as societies based on sound societal norms that we practice and encourage others to practice as well. Yes, the internet created a powerful and valuable marketplace of information and services. Yes, it enabled an exponential number of voices ranging from the noble to the heinous. Yes, that has enabled any and all of us to more easily find the affirmation we prefer versus the information we require. Yes, the internet and real-time communications has given the political class the ability to circumvent the press and play to their constituencies, their bases, their bases in real time. And yes, Yes, that appears to be having a rather deleterious effect on our representative deliberative democracy. Can we find a path back to objective truth and a pursuit of consensus via thoughtful de deliberation? Or do we slide downhill into alternate realities or what C. Wright Mills might consider the tyranny of the majority? I'm going to close with this. My fellow Knight Commissioner, Deb Roy from the MIT Media Lab, noted his vexing characterization of the impact of unfettered expression on our democratic republic. He said, is the internet to the First Amendment what the AK-47 is to the Second Amendment? How do we find balance between our freedoms and our societal norms? I choose to be optimistic. I work to find solutions. I trust we all will. I believe we can use our technology to help citizens have the tools and information they need to be thoughtful, informed citizens. But we're all going to have to work together to do that, to understand those problems and seek to address them in the best ways we can, structurally or simply through the leadership of our own models of behavior. I thank you for listening.